Hi, I'm Rob Holliday from News Services here at UNC Chapel Hill, and I'm joined today by Dr. Charles Conrad, who is an associate professor here at UNC Chapel Hill and also the director of the Southeast Regional Climate Center. Dr. Conrad, thanks so much for joining us. Welcome. Tornadoes, unfortunately, are pretty common this time of year, but what made this particular system so devastating with more than 40 people uh, killed across the, the nation and then all the damage estimates? Why were these so devastating? Well, it, you know, it was, a, it was a major tornado outbreak for the uh, southeast, but I think what was really unusual was, was how it hit North Carolina. And, and there were a couple of factors that came into play that made it especially devastating. One was there was a tremendous amount of wind shear in the atmosphere. And wind shear simply means that the winds were speeding up very rapidly and turning uh, as, as, as you go up through the atmospheric column. And that, of course, provides the twisting motions that are needed to form tornadoes. So that was in place. Then here in East Central North Carolina and going into the coastal plain, the, uh, the system, this very strong system with a lot of wind shear was approaching in the afternoon, and so we had the daytime heating, what we, what we uh, meteorology circles call the convective prime time. And so thunderstorms were developing, and they were developing in this atmosphere with a lot of shear, and so strong tornadoes developed, and, um, and so that's... Those, those basically were the two main ingredients. So if you take the whole heating dynamic out of all of this, what would the difference have been? Well, probably here we might have gotten a tornado or two, but they would have been weaker, uh, somewhat more sporadic. Can't say for sure without doing a you know, detailed case study, but, but there's no question that the tornadoes would have been weaker, damage would have been less, and so forth. Altogether, certainly we've heard about the, the damage that's happened, whether it's Sanford or Bertie County or even Wake County, all across North Carolina and the southeast, but roughly how many different tornadoes were spawned by this event? Well, we're still, uh, the Weather Service has gone out and done some detailed surveys, and, and a little, little bit of it depends on what you define as a tornado, because there were supercell thunderstorms that were producing them, and it's clear that, that there were just about maybe four or five supercell storms that moved across the eastern part of the state, and they were dropping tornadoes at different times. And, we don't have a continuous, we don't know exactly what was going on everywhere, but it, you know, it looks, I can tell you there was 60, 60 to 70 reports of tornadoes in different places. I would say there was probably at least seven, perhaps seven, maybe more tor uh, actual tornadoes. Actual tornadoes. We hear a lot of comparisons, at least here in North Carolina, to the events of 1984. Nationally, historically speaking, how significant were these storms compared to other ones in terms of the damage they caused, the loss of life? Well, I, I look at it here from the perspective of North Carolina, and there's only one other tornado outbreak that you mentioned there. The March 1984 outbreak was, there were, I think, 40-some uh, lives lost. So it was much, uh, the tornadoes were stronger, but there were fewer tornadoes, and a lot of those tornadoes hit uh, in rural areas. And so there was still a lot of devastation, lives lost, but, uh, but this tornado really, I think, comes in second place. And unfortunately, you know, it really focused more on these um, highly populated areas. And so I think when the damage is all added up, the damage is probably going to be greater with this one. But thankfully, the loss of life will be somewhat less. Speaking of the loss of life, uh, how valuable were some of the alert systems and then the time of day? I mean, could the death toll yeah. have been even worse than it, than it already is? Absolutely. And uh, that was just was a huge blessing, uh, was, was, in fact, the timing, although the timing made the tornadoes perhaps there were more tornadoes and stronger ones because it was during the time of the day that you can get tornadoes. People were up, uh, people were much more vigilant, more likely to be listening to the radio or watching the TV. So a lot of people were heeding the warnings uh, and, and, and sought safe shelter. Uh, so I think that was a big factor. Also, the National Weather Service did a tremendous job forecasting this. As far as I know, every single place that got hit by a tornado, they had tornado warnings up well ahead of time. They were in fact warning people about this several days in advance. The event itself happened, you know, throughout the southeast, but it seems like there's definitely Tornado Alley that happens, you know, you've got Texas and Oklahoma, mm -hmm. Kansas, seem to be really ripe spots, certainly the southeast. What is it that causes tornadoes to be so much more likely to happen in places like the plains in the southeast? Right, and yeah, the plains, you know, what we call Tornado Alley, extending from Texas all the way up into the Dakotas, gets more tornadoes than any other part of the world. And there's a very, very particular recipe that's needed to form a tornado. And uh, a key ingredient I already mentioned was wind shear. And so in the plains, there's just a lot more days in which you get that wind shear. 
Also, you have the Gulf of Mexico to the south, and so very warm, moist air comes up and can form strong storms in the presence of that wind shear. And then there's a third very interesting ingredient. There's uh, warm, dry air that can come off the elevated terrain in northern Mexico and the southwestern United States. And those three come in, and when they come in in exactly the right way, you get tornadoes. And so that recipe is made more frequently there than anywhere else. Tornadoes also occur pretty frequently in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, in parts of the southern U.S., uh, most frequently in Mississippi, followed by Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, then North Carolina. That excludes Florida. Florida actually gets them pretty frequently. So North Carolina, compared to a lot of states, doesn't get them that frequently. So that makes this event really uh, stand out. But it's a mix of wind shear and other meteorological things mm -hmm. that are happening then. Yeah, just the right combination of ingredients and the timing is critical of those ingredients coming in in exactly the right way to form a tornado. The coverage of this event, as you would expect, has been extensive. Uh, mm -hmm. But are there some things that haven't been focused on yet that you've been paying particular attention to? Well, uh, yeah, there's been a tremendous amount of media coverage. Uh, the Weather Service has already posted their, uh, their surveys of the damage. So there's a tremendous amount that's known. And really, I can't think of any aspect of this that really hasn't been covered. I find it interesting. I live in uh, western Wake County. Uh, my house is probably at least eight, nine miles from where the tornadoes were at. But we're finding uh, small bits, uh, shards of, of roofing, uh, s uh, bits of screen. Someone even found a small sign. There's lots of little bits of insulation. So this is material that actually was, uh, was, was uh, part of uh, structures that were apparently destroyed, ingested into these supercell storms, and then deposited on the north side. Something very, you know, just very interesting and you know, something you wouldn't ordinarily see, uh, bits of uh, insulation you know, falling from the sky. You can predict tornadoes to a degree, but they're also so unpredictable in many ways mm -hmm. also. Indeed. Is there a way to learn a lesson from this in terms of saying, you know, next time people should do this differently? It, it may be a bit too early to say, but are there some ways that you can learn from watching an event like this, especially when it comes to forecasting it? Well, certainly uh, I, I think tornadoes in the southeast are, are a bit distinct in some ways uh, from tornadoes in the plains. We, we're basically in, in, an, in an environment where there's more moisture. And so typically when a tornado is approaching, the ceiling of the clouds typically tend to be pretty, fairly low. Also, we live here in an area where there's lots of trees, there's hills. It's hard to see tornadoes. And uh, it's really interesting. I, I was looking at some of the videos of tornadoes. In a lot of cases, you can hardly see them or you can just see them very briefly. So anyway, tornadoes are very hard to see uh, in the southeastern U.S. Also, when they occur, particularly when there are outbreaks, they tend to move very quickly. Uh, these tornadoes were moving on the order of 55, maybe even 60 miles an hour. And so that makes them especially dangerous. Uh, and so, so those are distinct things, and that makes them very dangerous to people if they're not already in a shelter. And so I think that lesson, you know, is maybe learned more by people, you know, just again, the fast movement and, and having a hard time, you know, seeing these things. Well, Charles Conrad, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate all the information. You're welcome.